Hey, we are live on YouTube again. This is the MTC board. As you can tell from my really fancy sign over here, um, which I should fix because it's kind of crooked, but, um, and I got my trusty guitar because once again, people ask me to perform a song, but I'm here mainly as a journalist to talk about covering the international symposium on online journalism. So it's been a huge event, actually. I think, uh, what, 7,200 people have registered. There's been uh, participants from 132 different countries. So this truly is an international event, and I'm proud to be participating in it. I met some really great people. We've had a great time, especially today, because I think finally that, what, day three of the conference? This has been going on since Monday, so we're going to be here every day doing this coverage um, until Friday. So that's five days, five days and uh, five nights of editing video. But um, that's what happens when you're a journalist. In the meantime, I did get a chance to play some music, which is great. And uh, thanks uh, to David Bowie for being here today to join us in the background back there. Thanks, David, for all your great music. Um, I really had a good time today and I felt like for the first time, the social uh, aspect of this uh, international symposium actually started to take shape in a way that felt almost natural. I mean, it felt okay. It, you know, I've complained in the past about these platforms like Wonder and Shindig and, you know, feeling kind of forced into these chat rooms and things and how that actually creates a lot of technologically based um, social anxiety for people. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's difficult, you know, to start a conversation online with people that you've never met before, you know, nothing about them. And all you see is an icon. So, you know, it can be very impersonal and it's not always an easy gap to, to breach, to bridge. So I think today we did that though. And a lot of that had to do with Mint, uh, who is the uh, technologist at the New York Times, and she was able to uh, talk to us afterwards on the Wonder platform about specifically AR, uh, augmented, augmented reality, and yes, there are some apparently uh, rumors about some new glasses coming out. Remember the Google glasses? Well, keep your eye out for this. Um, then there's also um, this whole idea of augmented and virtual reality um, becoming a part of news coverage, which is, you know, all very cutting edge, you know, you're hearing it here first, folks, this is not something that CNN is doing today, necessarily. Um, and one of the takeaways on that uh, was very clear from the e evening conference on this subject. And that was that uh, the technology is trying to catch up with the demand. So uh, as a news journalist, I would love to be using uh, photo gym tree. I would love to be using AR platforms and um, augmented reality to tell my story as a journalist and as a musician as well, because I think, you know, here in the studio, I often um, am thinking of multimedia ways of presenting this music to people and the story behind the music. There's a story behind every story. That's why um, my MTC report, when uh, my friend Space Dog did the intro, he says, um, the news behind the news, because I think a lot of times that's what I'm trying to do is I'm, I'm trying to find the news behind the news. And that's what every good journalist should be doing. I think, I mean, you know, I could be wrong, but I think that's basically the idea of journalism is that, you know, you can follow the crowd, excuse me a second here. You can follow the crowd. You can follow the pack. You can report on everything that everybody else is reporting. And that's what corporate media does most of the time. But if you are an independent journalist and you, you want to tell the truth and you want to bring information to people and help educate the public and because it's in the public interest, then there are certain things that you do um, and certain sacrifices you make and also certain commitments that you make. Um, one of them is to be at a conference like this where for five days of your life, you are doing nothing but eating, breathing, and sleeping journalism. And I'm familiar with doing that as a musician because a lot of times you're on tour or you're in the studio for days at a time. And that's all you do is live, breathe, sleep, eat music. Um, and then it's a beautiful experience, but it can also be, it can also be a little bit uh, distracting at times to your personal life. 
Um, sorry, I have a hat here. I went out on the on the boat earlier because I needed to get away. There is a time, you know, during every conference, and they encourage this. There's a, there's a time for everybody to get away and to kind of um, think about why am I doing this? And um, what is life about, you know? And so even in the middle of a conference, I think you have to take breaks and they have done that. They've allowed us uh, for uh, several hours at a time during the day to eat, sleep, take notes, do podcasts, you know, record videos like this, do whatever it takes um, to process all the information that you're getting, because it is a really intensive uh, five days of conversation and discussion and presentation and education. Today, we had some major information thrown at us about using advanced search tools on search engines. Um, and, you know, that gets really into the research aspect of journalism, which is very important, of course, and fact checking, which is incredibly important. So um, in a lot of ways, journalists are like academicians or uh, academic researchers because you have to spend a lot of your time uh, sourcing information and uh researching information and using databases and charts and graphs and all sorts of things, all, all sorts of anal analytics, you know, to try to understand a story and to present that to people in an understandable way. So there was a lot of talk about that today. Um, there were several sessions that I thought were very unique. Um, and I think, you know, the kind of thing that you're probably not going to get at most uh, journalism conferences, or at least the ones that I've attended recently, so I'll give you an example. Let me put up here online. Um, I'm going to check out the program. One of the things that happened that I thought was interesting is that I participated uh, and I interacted with Anna Palmer and Jake Sherman, the co-founders of Punchbowl News. And that was interesting because they are a whole new model that just popped up over the last year or so. That's caused a lot of waves. Um, and they've, you know, been... Um, uh, They've received accolades and also been criti criticized by fellow journalists and editors and publishers. Um, Evan Smith is the CEO and co-founder of the Texas Tribune, and he was the the host, the MC for that session, the chairperson for that session. And uh, he is a very interesting guy himself. Of course, his personality is really unique, so you got to check him out. Um, Evan Smith started the Texas Tr Tribune uh, as a co-founder, and the Texas Tribune, if you didn't know is yes, a major Texas newspaper, um, but it's also a nonprofit. So it has a nonprofit model, which is also where I'm working in with Democracy Watch News. We also have a nonprofit model. And so it's very interesting to see the differences between the corporate model, the commercial models and the nonprofit models, because straight up, we discussed that today several times. One of the issues especially during that session, this was the morning session, the keynote session was Anna Palmer and Jake Sherman. And um, this whole idea of what constitutes news, whether you know people are caught up in a, bu a bubble in, uh, in reporting on what happens in Washington, DC instead of their own communities, which I totally agree with, is totally true. The difference between nonprofits and commercial enterprises when it comes to news organizations, um, nonprofits, tend to have subscribers and donors. And we talked yesterday during part two of this report about Catherine Viner's keynote address. She's the editor in chief of The Guardian, um, which a disclaimer, The Guardian did interview me last year, actually, um, during protests that I was covering in Seattle about what's going on here. So I have to throw that out there, but um, she did a great presentation um, about their model, which uh, involves uh, contributors, um, donors. So, uh, however, she says they're not a charity; they are a working news organization, and so they they see it as you know people um, contributing to their uh, cause. Um, there's also this commercial model, of course, and the difference sometimes is that the commercial model involves potential pressure from advertisers and from the corporate ownership in terms of the coverage, the news coverage. So it can create at least the appearance of bias, okay? And you see that all the time in corporate news where there are certain stories they just don't want to touch because it affects the, you know, the, the stockholders and the corporations that own the news network. And there's becoming fewer and fewer news networks because of the fact that the Federal Communications Commission in the United States has traditionally um, favored and sided with large corporations and media monopolies, allowing 
uh, the lack of regulation in terms of the consolidation of corporate media ownership. I did the Mr. Smith goes to Washington thing and testified before the Federal Communications Commission standing there saying, I have the documents in my hand. And they were documents, uh, research papers uh, done by uh, academicians, um, professors Napoli and Yanich and others um, at the University of Delaware and, and other places where they were commissioned by the FCC to study the effects of uh, corporate media consolidation. Um, and those findings were suppressed because when I went before the FCC and testified about these reports, the FCC claimed they had no information and didn't even know they existed, even though the FCC had commissioned them. So what does that tell you? Um, I, and, you know, Michael Powell, uh, the, brother, the brother of Colin Powell, was the chairperson for the FCC for a while. And uh, there were a lot of Republicans on the FCC who sided with corporations. Um, the truth is, is that the research shows that um, corporate media consolidation, the monopolization of the media by just a few major corporate entities actually um, limits local news coverage. It also limits female and minority ownership of the media and has a lot of other negative effects that you can just imagine. It serves the, the interests of the status quo and the corporate elite. So there you go. That's a little uh, sideline on some of the issues that you deal with as a journalist, but the commercial model versus the non-commercial model, um, you know, you would think there would be a big divide between there and, in, in, and maybe in philosophy in terms of the way that they're funded, yes, but in the terms of way you cover the news, the way you cover the news, both um, sides are trying to protect themselves from pressure from outside forces, whether it be political organizations or um, corporate entities, as I mentioned before, or the ownership of your own, you know, newspaper, magazine, online website, um, television network or station, radio stations. By the way, Cumulus and Clear Channel, well, Clear Channel at one time, a few years ago, bought up 880 uh, radio stations around the country. So that's why you had Rush Limbaugh in every station and, and, and hardcore right-wing conservatives in every community across the United States, even the most progressive cities in the United States. That was because Clear Channel bought up all, um, 880 stations and Cumulus bought uh, about uh, 330. So a lot of progressive voices got kicked off the air at that time. That's why Tom Hartman lost his original radio program and you name it, you know, even, even Ron Reagan, you know, uh, Ronald Reagan's son, who turned out to be uh, very liberal or progressive, uh, he even got kicked off the air. Mike Malloy, Norman Goldman, uh, Nicole Sandler. These are all people I've worked with. I've been on their shows multiple times. They all lost their voices in the media because uh, there was a huge takeover by conservative interests. By the way, progressive political organizations and movements don't seem to understand this, by the way, and don't seem to spend any time trying to invest money in uh, media, but they should because it would make a big difference. And it did because those networks like uh, Air America and the Nova, I believe network that Mike Malloy was on, they made a huge difference in the election of Barack Obama and helped um, um, get him into office. So maybe one of the reasons why the conservatives bought up those stations and turned them into sports stations and other things like in Seattle, there was a progressive talk station. It was turned into a, a sports station and that was, I think, actually by CBS who did that. And then in Portland, there was a progressive talk station uh, and that was sold off by Clear Channel. So at least in Portland, you have xray.fm, which is a more populist grassroots kind of approach to media that was created by the people there in their own interest. That's never really happened in Seattle, although, you know, there is some community radio base around here. Um, there was a group called Progressive Radio Northwest that I was involved with and did some panels with that included people like Norman Goldman. And uh, we tried to sell them on the idea that everything was going to be online. And that's where, you know, digital media was the way to go. And unfortunately, they kind of drug their feet on that. They wanted to apparently come up with five or six million dollars to buy a, a commercial radio station or something, which is about what it would cost back then. Uh, it's probably even more expensive now. But in the beginning, we mentioned the FCC before, and they are culpable in all of this corporate media takeover stuff, um, except for uh, Chairman or uh, the, the commissioners Adelstein and Cops. They both actually stood up for independent and public media when the others on the commission wouldn't. Um, but they got ignored by their own fellow commissioners. Um, but the FCC 
has been involved in a lot of this and um, it, it should have been a, the, an idea that the public owns the airwaves and that's why the Federal Communications Commission was originally formed. Um, unfortunately, it's turned into you know, corporations own the airwaves even though they're supposedly uh, bequeathed to the public. But you figure it out, it's a political game out there and a, and a money making game about corporate monopolies owning media. But it's also one of the attributing factors to why the United States is ranked, well, last year was ranked 48th in the world in terms of press freedom. And that was because of corporate media ownership. It does limit the voices that you hear and see in your media. Everyone knows that. Um, and those of us in, you know, that work in media know that especially. But um, a tribute to, you know, goes out to uh, the folks who organized the International Symposium on Online Journalism. And I'm not saying that just because I was a participant, but also because of the fact that there's a lot of uh, corporate media that happens out there that um, doesn't cover the kinds of things and other symposiums that don't cover the kinds of things that were being covered today, including um, a session today um, uh, that had a panel on how to protect women from online threats against them. Um, and it turned out that there was a survey showing that 70% of female journalists that you know, responded to this survey said that they f have felt threatened online by men. And that also 52% um, of them um, responded by saying that they had felt physically threatened by being doxxed and all sorts of other things. So there you go. Um, uh, there was also, you know, so that's an issue that corporate media is not covering, which of course they should. Um, and that was a keynote presentation earlier in the morning, uh, which was um, moderated by the executive editor of the Texas Tribune. He's a very interesting guy who we'll talk about in a minute, but how will journalists and news organizations use uh, photogrammetry, augmented reality and virtual reality to tell their stories? That was another huge issue today during this international conference. Um, Will AR and VR work for coverage of breaking news stories? That was my question to the panel, which they uh, all addressed in depth because it's something that they've all been thinking about as well. Um, will it work, you know, for uh, your local public radio station or TV station? How are they, how are they going to use online content to augment uh, what they're doing? What is the current state of the journalistic technology revolution? And the takeaway on that was that, and it came directly from Mint, who was one of the presenters from the New York Times, their technologist who said, look, everybody's waiting for 5G. And we've had these ideas about how to use augmented reality and virtual reality and 360 um, journalism um, since you know a decade ago, but we've been waiting for the technology to catch up so that it's actually possible relatively inexpensively to do this. Um, and so far that hasn't been the case so much. So 5G is one of the things that, you know, is supposed to make it easier. Um, there's a lot of information that, uh, and data that has to be shared in order for 3D virtual reality um, to take place. So there you go, that was a takeaway. We're not quite there yet, which is why you don't see a lot of this on CNN or MSNBC or whatever other news and political organizations, news organizations, there's a, um, a trend toward it, of course, and those of us who are trying to stay out on the cutting edge of this are trying to educate ourselves and figure out how to use it. But that question that I asked today, which is, can VR and AR, augmented and virtual reality, be used for breaking news stories, is something that uh, is on everybody's mind. And the answer was, it, not yet. So there you go. It's a little bit disappointing for those of us who would really like to push the envelope on that. Um, but there's nothing you can do right now. But by the way, the New York Times does have some projects and Mint shared one of them with us, which was reconstructing an artist's loft, I believe in New York. And it's a really, really interesting thing. So if you go to the New York Times app, you'll you'll find it under their uh 3D section. It's a um, it's an interesting thing to do. You can explore somebody's flat and look at their art and their record collection and all sorts of things um, through VR, which is based on photogrammetry, um, which we talked about uh, a lot today. And that has to do with taking photos. As a journalist, what you do is you would walk around the environment with your 
your smartphone or whatever uh, photography device you use, and you take pictures of an area or an object that become a uh, virtual reality um, that people can negotiate um, on their uh, through three, 3D uh, goggles and glasses and also through so there's a way of doing this to where you can actually relatively easily these days, um, but not necessarily quickly, um, photograph things and turn it into a 3D reality that other people can uh, experience online. So there is um, a section of the New York Times called Reconstructing, Reconstructing Journalistic Scenes in 3D, and it gives you examples of how that was done. Uh, that actually came out of uh, a session that took place on... Uh, the wonder platform after the day sessions where uh, mint was in the room and willing to interact with people so we used that interactive platform to video conference with each other and I, I don't know if you're familiar with what wonder is but it has separate rooms that you can set up if you host it um, where people can um, have video in conversations and um, audio or video conversations you can either use an icon or just a blank um, icon um, or you can actually use video and people can see you so you get you go you enter a circle that other people are in or you create these circles that other people can enter and then you can have conversations and so that was happening today and that was one of the more successful examples how these platforms can work uh, in the past I've seen them not work so well because people like as I mentioned before have social anxiety associated with talking to someone even if it's a video because you know it's just like being uh, in a, a party in person. You all, you know, you're worried. You know, do I look okay? Is my hair a mess? You know, <laughs> silly things like that. It's like, well, you're still seeing someone, and and you might even be seeing the environment they're in. So maybe they're, you know, in their private space too, which makes it feel a little bit more intimate. Their cat might be climbing across their shoulders or something. I was laughing earlier today and tweeting about how interesting it is to be participating in an online international online symposium this major conference um with people top notch in the field who uh are discussing very weighty issues that affect all of us including climate change tomorrow is one of the themes and you're listening to this and you're participating actually in this conference and you know if you don't want to use your video camera you don't you know in a video conference you can turn it off or use an icon or whatever you want so um here I am in my pajamas participating in an international symposium. I thought it was great. I had my Urban Mate tea next to me. And I felt very comfortable. And I was joking about the only thing that was missing was a, a purring cat, you know, um, curled up next to me or something, you know, because it, it felt very comfortable to be able to interact with people on the other side of the planet um, from my own living room and, you know, be comfortable with that. So that was an interesting experience. And, I'm sure that people will be experiencing more and more of that as we all get more and more used to video conferencing. Uh, but there were a lot of other things going on today um, that were very interesting besides the conferences that I mentioned before. Um, and I think there's more interesting things that are going to be happening tomorrow. So I have several takeaways about it. Um, I think that you know the fact that technologists are waiting for the adoption of 5d and faster data pipelines for vr and ar uh, to be used by reporters on breaking news coverage is is exactly the kind of information that i was looking for we aren't quite there yet and that answered a question that has been you know dogging me for a while um i'm anxious to get on with that media revolution and one of my statements which i said over and over again is that i realized in the past in an article i wrote that all of these mediums were going to change from radio and television and turning turn into just multimedia on whatever device you wanted to use, mostly handheld devices at some point. Um, but also, you know, there really is no such thing anymore as TV or radio or what's a podcast as opposed to a live stream, as opposed to a video conference. It's all mixed up together. It's just multimedia and whatever art form or profession you, uh, you practice, um, or hobby, you there is a there are many different platforms for it, and you can choose as an individual which ones to utilize and which ones not to. Um, but video, audio, 
3D realities, um, augmented realities. They're all available to you there. Um, digital data presentations. Um, there are apps now, and some of them are actually, believe it or not, available at the New York Times through one of their apps. They also have some trainings um, and other things for journalists, but uh, you can actually go to their site and see how some of these uh, technologies are being used, and that's very instructive. Um, but, you know, we're still waiting, like I said, for the pipeline. We're also waiting for, uh, and this is, you know, something that one of the presenters talked about today during the evening session is that uh, we're also waiting for the audiences out there, the consumers, if you want to call them, or the, the people who participate in media. We're looking for them to kind of catch up too, because they haven't all gotten used to the idea of these kinds of technologies. So it's very important, I think, what, um, what Retha Hill uh, pointed out, Professor of Practice and Director of the New Media Innovation and Entrepreneurship Lab at Arizona State University. Uh, she made it very clear that you can develop all of these technologies as much as you want, but until people feel like they're a necessity in their lives, like, you know, the GPS uh, system that people now use to negotiate all over, you know, through their own city, streaming platforms like YouTube and Facebook, these are all uh, uh, things that people are getting used to um, and some of the things some of those things have become almost a necessity in people's lives in their own minds at least and that's when they share them with other people it becomes important that app you know that allows them you know to get food delivered uh, to their home or allows them to get their traffic quicker or whatever it is it's something that might be very useful and practical for them and so what, what um, Rita was saying was that what Professor Hill was saying was that at some point, you know, people will have to be convinced about that in that same way about virtual reality and augmented reality and other uh, platforms like that, because right now it seems like something very new to them. Um, but at some point when they start using applications that are actually incredibly useful and make their lives easier, then um, that the usership will, you know, in increase exponentially. Until then, it's kind of it is a hard sell at some time, you know, at some point, to try to convince people that they should be using these technologies who don't actually own, you know, uh, some of the hardware to go with it, like the goggles and things. So, um, but it was a very interesting uh, panel about immersive journalism, and that's what this is all under the heading of is immersive journalism. In other words, how do you really bring people into the story? How do you bring them into it so that they experience things that you've experienced as a journalist uh, while you were you know researching the story or interviewing people or walking through that neighborhood so you can recreate uh, virtual neighborhoods and literally people can walk through the same neighborhood that you're reporting on virtually um, there are some actually there's uh, a few google google earth apps that are are very advanced now that are 3d and uh, virtual reality platforms and software um, uh, capturing reality. Okay, so IceCloud 3D was one of the um, recommendations we got today from Ben uh, Kramer, who's an independent journalist technologist who deals with a lot of this kind of stuff. Um, and there's uh, Sketchfab from the UK and Thomas Flynn, was a part of the panel today uh, and he had a lot to say about you know these applications so there are all places where you can uh, model 3d images and um, also platforms where you can post them because in all of these cases as far as I know you need multiple platforms in order to actually create these 3d realities you need a way of um, creating the content, which is, you know, a 3D animation program, or you could use um, uh, photogrammetry um, to do that. Um, but you have to model that stuff. And then in order to post it, you need a platform that will be able to host uh, these 3D realities, which you take a lot of bandwidth and a lot of uh, intricate uh, algorithms and information. So it can be tricky. Um, 
but there are ways of learning all of this. And we found out today that actually uh, Mint from the creative technologist from the New York Times is actually willing and, and her team is willing to actually give news organizations some trainings on how to use this stuff, which is really cool. Um, because you're getting it from the people who are developing it um, and getting training from those people is important. She asked me, you know, what was the most important thing uh, that a journalist uh, could gain or needs from these uh, particular new groundbreaking platforms. And I said, well, we need help basically learning about the availability of the technology because a lot of us are not technologists ourselves or we may not have a science uh, reporter on our staff. Um, uh, so we need to be, we need to get the heads up that this stuff even exists so we won't know that we can use it. Then once we are aware of what the cutting edge of the technology is, and most of us, you know, want to be on that cutting edge, then, um, we need people to help train us to use it. Um, so we need people to actually, uh, work with news organizations and do online, uh, at least, you know, training sessions and, so that, that is available and that can happen. Um, we definitely need free, uh, more free and shareware in these technologies so that uh, people who don't have a huge bank account or, or a huge commercial sponsor or something can afford to use them because some of it is very intricate software. Um, anyway, we had some really great presentations on that whole issue. Um, and that particular uh, session was um, well, was moderated, uh, the chair of that session was Robert Hernandez, and he's the professor of professional practice at the University of Southern California. Um, so it was a very good day in terms of information that you're not normally gonna get at your average uh, expensive uh, membership type of journalism conference. Um, by the way, this one is not expensive especially compared to a lot of them that are that take a lot of money. But just to give you a few of the presenters today, um, there was actually um, uh, Eliza Lise Munoz from the, she's the executive director for the IWMF. And that was the group that was, um, that's the International Women's Media Foundation and that she was the chair and presenter of the on, online violence against women journalists uh, session. Um, and there was also a reporter from uh, the investigative reporting program at UC Berkeley for that, the global director of research for the International Coalition for uh, Journalism. And there was, uh, Ela Stapley, who was very interesting, she was the digital security advisor and founder for Siskin Labs in the UK. And she had a lot to say about um, the fact that most um, her and others on this panel were, you know, pointed out that that media is a very much Dale um, is a very much a male dominated uh, industry, and that most of the upper management and the ownership are male. So that is one of the barriers um, to making sure that female members of the staff are protected because a lot of times the management is not sympathetic. It's not as sympathetic as they should be. Um, so that was, that's a pretty good wrap up. I think of the day I'm trying to think if there's anything else. I have intricate notes here that I haven't had a chance to go through um, and process as much as I'd like yet that talk about other ways to use LIDAR um, information um, and an iOS device to uh, create uh, 3D realities using Google Earth. So uh, you can fly people through a geographical area. There's actually pre-produced uh, footage of this kind of stuff that people have developed on Google Earth that are uh, Creative Commons licensed. So you could actually use it for your story. Uh, maybe you can find one in your geographic area, but it's just in a way of adding another virtual uh, immersive experience to your news story. So um, these are things that, um, I remember Ben Kramer was responding to that. He was kind of the indie journalist technologist guy. Uh, and he was saying that uh, 
he if he was going to try to do breaking news uh, reports using these technologies, which is very isn't really happening, and he's never done that. Um, he would use uh, lidar, iOS device, and Sketchfab. So that's it. It's like um, you could do it. It takes a little while. Um, it's not immediate. You can also take a bunch of photos and then uh, um, just use a uh, photogrammetry grammetry program and uh, create the sort of photosynthesis thing that you know will create a three D image of what you're reporting on. Um, <laughs> Okay, everybody, that was just a fun song to top off the day. Uh, so peace out, y'all. Hope you have a good evening, and we'll see you probably tomorrow around the same time. And in the meantime, you know, you can check me out on Instagram and Facebook, and Twitter, because I'm, I'm there doing coverage of this conference and other things. And then my music is actually going to be released soon. Uh, I have an EP, and so be looking for it soon on Spotify and all, all of those places, iTunes and Apple Music and all that. And I'll let you know when that happens. I'm really excited about it because it's been really fun recording this rock music and just putting together a band and you know, doing music. I mean, I'm in Seattle. That's why I moved here because I love the music. So besides, besides being a great place to do journalism because it's so newsworthy 
and there's so much going on here all the time. Um, every time Jeff Bezos sneezes, you know, it's like there's a new story, but, uh, or Bill Gates or, you know, Howard Schultz, all those people. But anyway, um, you can also check out what we do at the Jeff Santa show. Like I'm on there every Friday at 2.30 p.m. Pacific time. Um, his show is really interesting. It's got a lot of very educated, informative guests. Um, and I'm not, not talking about me, although I hope people think that about me, but um, Harvey Kay, the icon, iconoclastic historian is on there. John Nichols from The Nation Magazine, Melissa Tomlinson from Badass Teachers. I love her. Um, her Boyd, uh, editor over at uh, Amsterdam News and author of Black in Detroit. Great guy. There's so many cool people on that uh, show with Jeff and he's such a good host and, and so good with people and helping them feel comfortable. Um, and they talk a lot about a lot of, uh, they talk a lot about cutting edge issues um, like we've been talking about today and things that affects hopefully, you know, people's daily lives instead of just, you know, who's famous and who's not these days. Um, so real journalism and real talk about what's actually going on in the world um, and hopefully solution oriented, you know, instead of just ranting and raving and complaining, which is good too, because you need to um, also maybe offering a few uh, solutions. And of course, I'm being uh, a little bit facetious about that. Of course, I want, you know, I want all to be solutions, hopefully. Um, and that's important, though, I think politically and in journalism that we need to offer people solutions, not just um, inform them about the issues and the problems. Um, and until tomorrow around five, I think, you know, so tomorrow is a whole other series of things going on uh, at the 22nd International Symposium on Online Journalism. My gosh, it's been going on that long. Uh, it's day four. So there's going to be a keynote session called Reimagining News for Black Americans, Paving a Path Towards Equity in Journalism. And this should have been, I think, the, the opening keynote address, but that's just my opinion. Um, but you'll have uh, Lauren Williams and Okoto Afori Atta, who are co-founders of Capital B, Amanda Zamorov, co-founder and publisher of The 19th. Um, there'll be a workshop on covering climate change um, called Best Practices for How to Localize a Planet-Sized Story, which is cool. Um, and that'll involve Amal Ahmed, the reporter for the Texas Observer, Frank Mungin, official innovation officer from the local media association. Uh, Donovan Quintero, reporter from the Navajo Times. Uh, Bernadette Woods Plackey, program director for Climate Matters. Um, then there's also gonna be a panel on, it's not the old op-ed page anymore, the growth of opinion in online journalism with Katie Kingsbury, who's the opinion editor at the New York Times. So that's gonna be very interesting. Uh, then you've got, um, Karen Atia, Global Opinions Editor for the Washington Post. Sewell Chan, editor page, Editorial Page Editor for the Los Angeles Times. Matthew Iglesias, Writer and Editor for Slow Boring. And then the day is gonna end up with this thing called Cracking the Code for the Local News Through Networking and Collaboration. And that actually is gonna be chaired by, the, by Karen Rendlett, who's the Director of Journalism, of the Journalism Program at the Knight Foundation. So, and those are the people who sponsored this whole event. So kudos to them for putting this all together. Um, you'll also hear from Sarah Beth Berman, who's the CEO of American Journalism Project, Sue Cross, Executive Director and CEO for the Institute for Nonprofit News, or INN, Emily Gilpin, Managing Editor for Indigenous News in Canada, Lisa Hayamata, uh, GNI Startup Lab Senior Program Manager and at Lion Publishers, Mukhtar Ibrahim, founder of the SAHAN Journal, and then uh, Mazin Sinamed, uh, Sinamed co-executive director for Documenting. And these are all going to be amazing panels that you're not going to hear anywhere else, folks. So, And you can go on YouTube, by the way, and check out um, some of these discussions because they're posting them soon after the sessions take place. Um, but this is Mark Taylor Canfield, and I've been reporting all week, and I'll be reporting... Uh, for the next couple of days on the program of the Knight Center for Journalism in the Americas at the University of Texas at Austin, which involves the Moody College of Communications School of Journalism and Media. And it'll be going on through Friday. So until then, uh, you can use the hashtag ISOJ2021. Uh, that's how people are, are kind of 
organizing their topics around this is, uh, the issue of this conference. And you can go and see the day-to-day -day schedule um, on the isoj.org website. So until tomorrow, peace out. This is Mark Taylor Canfield reporting on the International Symposium on Online Journalism for the MTC Report. And I uh, hope you check us out tomorrow. I might actually do a little bit more music as well. And 